the Star Trek replicator, one of the most popular pieces of sci-fi technology, perhaps neck to neck with the lightsaber, right? You want a steak, you want a sandwich, you want a beverage that you had once in Tuscany or Spain, uh, some exotic wine with the snap of a finger, with a voice command, with the push of a button, you can have that replicated for you in the convenience of your own mess hall, right? That is the Star Trek replicator. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is something that we're one step closer to today. Yes, in the realm of beverages, we've had a major breakthrough coming out of the stealth mode is the particular invention by Mr. David Friedberg. We're going to be going over the work of David Friedberg and what exactly this replicator means, how it works, what are some of the inefficiencies that it helps us to unravel? Because you can imagine what it takes, okay, to bring that steak to your table. To bring the steak to your table, crops need to be grown. That means fertilizer needs to be dug out from somewhere, the land needs to be fertilized, Irrigation happens, the crops are grown, the crops are fed to the cattle, the cattle is then raised and slaughtered, it is packaged and then transported to you. But how about if all of that supply chain can be cut down and simply by using the essential ingredients in your living room, mess hall, kitchen, whatever it might be, you can get all that stuff. So let's start by some background information. Whom is this David Friedberg, of whom you speak. I call David Friedberg, born June 1980, is an American entrepreneur, businessman, and angel investor. He, he uh, founded and was chief executive of Climate Corporation, whose 1.1 billion sale to Monsanto in 2013, he sold his company to Monsanto, was the first unicorn finance, unicorn being these businesses that, that you know, startup businesses that then sell, right? over a billion dollars. He was the first unicorn in the emerging agriculture technology space. And without further ado, we're going to be getting into what Mr. David Friedberg is up to with regards to this replicator here. But first of all, let's start with the structure of the business because the business structure is quite important here because we're talking about deep research in the field of science and technology. Similar to what we heard recently about fusion, these things take a long time. They have a long runway. So you have to set up your business in such a way where you are incentivizing the long run as opposed to looking at the short-term gains so that then you can get funding and such, right? So typically, you have to show some kind of a product, an app, a first iteration of it. And you say, hey, look, look what I've done. And then you can get funding and then you can create the next one. And hopefully with the sales of the first version, you can also fund the next iterations, right? First Tesla and then the second Tesla, you know, first iPhone and then the second iPhone. But in places like this, in deep scientific breakthrough research, it doesn't work that way. You're going to have to be in the dark, in the development room, in the dark development room for a while. That means the money is flowing in without results. And if you, and hence the way you set up the venture is very important. So let's start with that. How exactly is this venture set up? Maybe you could tell people what is the structure of the production board? How many projects have come out of it so mm -hmm. far? And then what project number is this one? Yeah. So we have, um, I set it up in 2017. Uh, I started making personal investments and started a few companies after I sold my uh, prior business called the Climate Corporation, which makes uh, software for farmers. I sold it to Monsanto in 2013. And then I was making personal investments and starting some projects myself. I had a series of conversations with Larry Page uh, from Alphabet about doing something together. I wasn't interested in working at Alphabet again. He was really interested in the kinds of things I was working on. Um, and so I agreed to set up this holding company where I would contribute these investments and these companies I'd started into it. And Alphabet became a minority shareholder by putting capital in. And then over the years, we've raised additional capital from Bill Gates and Allen & Co and Bailey Gifford, BlackRock, all those folks you mentioned, a lot of strategic family offices. So we don't operate like a fund. Um, we don't take a management fee out. We don't have an incentive to mark up investments and go raise our next fund. We're basically a balance sheet, right? We're a company uh, that owns stakes in other companies. Most of those companies we start so several minority investments we've made in, in businesses that are strategically aligned with the stuff we're doing. But generally, we start businesses. So we will 
So again, after selling his company to Monsanto for $1.1 billion, okay, obviously he had some funds and um, he had some associations with Larry Page of Google. He was a former Google employee, an early Google employee. So he had some funds and he was doing some, he was uh, investing in certain things and also funding some of his ideas. And he got Larry Page of Google to be part of this particular production board. Production board is the name of his holding company. And the idea being that they're going to incubate long-term science and technology investments, incubate there being a core term in the sense that we're not looking to start a company. We're not looking for something where you're looking for a product and you're going to raise venture capital because this is going to take some time. So we're incubating this thing in this holding company. And then after that, We'll move on when we see a viable product, as we've seen now, which we're going to be getting into shortly, um, into the, the, the full production and the funding and all that. And a lot of time um, with scientists, with research teams, with academics trying to identify new and emerging trends in science and technology that we think could enable some sort of breakthrough opportunity. We also spend a lot of time in the markets we operate in, and then we really try and identify what's possible. And we ask ourselves, you know, how can we reinvent a system of production? on planet Earth, you know, one of these systems that makes things that people consume or provides health or therapeutic uh, products to people, how can we reinvent that system using these emerging uh, technical capabilities or emerging science? And then we'll typically run an R&D cycle in-house. Once we've done that R&D cycle and we feel confident that the technology that we're contemplating is actually possible, then we will form a new business. When we form a new business, it's like any other startup, it's a C-corp. And, um, you know, the team that we've been working with on this project will become employees of that business. They'll all get equity in that business. And we're the sing singular funder of that business, typically for quite a long period of time. Um, and then, you know, in many of our businesses, we ultimately raise money from other investors into them. Uh, makes sense, makes sense. Incubate, you have a team working on various projects. He's focusing on biotechnology, by the way. Biotechnology is the next frontier, okay? We have done a lot of work on the mechanical engineering, on the chemical engineering front on the um, perhaps even nuclear engineering. However, bioengineering, the Star Trek replicator, that is something that we have not quite perfected. How do we, and we know about creating the synthetic meats now that, that is coming up, um, but we shall now continue. Okay, we shall go to the next phase of this by talking about the inefficiencies associated with the way we currently do things, okay? The way we currently do things, which has to do with, you know, getting uh, the entire supply chain, right? The entire supply chain involved with getting you that stake that you want, as opposed to what Mr. Friedberg is looking to create here and which he has indeed created in the space of beverages. Let's continue. All right, so let's get to today's business. You had shown uh, at a poker game myself, Chamath, and a couple of besties. This project, I guess, when you were in the industrial design phase, um, what is it today that you're announcing and taking out of stuff? Well, if you wouldn't mind, let me just take a step back and talk about sure. some, like one of our kind of core beliefs at the production board and how that led to this opportunity. So, you know, when you look at, um, uh, you know, how humans make and consume things, <laughs> we, um, we've built a system of industry, right? And so we take, um, all these uh, um, these things that were old technology, and, and you know we've talked about this in our all-in pod, like growing animals to make meat. Uh, mm. The way we do that today is we take fertilizer, we we mine it from we mine potash in Canada, we put it in the corn belt in the U.S., put it on the ground, we grow corn, we take that corn, we feed it to cows in Texas, we kill the cows, we move them to New York steakhouses. The whole system is super inefficient. We use technology that's been around for ten thousand years growing plants, feeding animals, making meat, and delivering it. Um, and that whole system takes about 30 times as much energy as it actually produces in food. And this is true in many of the things that humans make. And manufacturing um, and production is really kind of the mainstay of consumerism, right? Like every year, humans are only happy if they have more this year than they had last year. That's a fundamental fact of human psychology. And so every year we see consumption go up, and as a result, we see production go up and GDP goes up.
excuse me there, human needs are insatiable. Okay, that's an important part of what he's mentioning there. Okay, when someone has something, we also want that said something. Okay, we are technologists, we go out and we tinker around with things. And when somebody creates a new red ball, all of a sudden, everybody wants that new red ball. Okay, and if you have one red ball today, you want two red balls tomorrow. And if the Joneses have three red balls, okay, you want four red balls. So this is how economic growth happens, okay, because of the insatiability of human wants. So the GDP has to grow. If you're not growing, you're stagnating, you're, you're dying. And if you're not growing and you can't get enough red balls, then you're going to start fighting each other for the red balls. So this is the process, right? In this case, we're talking about food. Okay, specifically in the realm of bio bioengineering, food is a key aspect. Okay, when we talk about biological compounds, carbon compounds, organic compounds, typically you're talking about carbohydrates, proteins, fats, and nucleic acids. Okay, there are other organic compounds that are out there as well, but they're uh, created through process like petroleum, for example, a chain of uh, carbon and cer certain other compounds. But in this case, we need more of the beef. We need more of the juice and all that kind of stuff. We have to keep growing it. So we need to keep mining the fertilizer and we have to keep making the farms bigger and bigger. Uh, we come up with technologies to centralize these things and make them more efficient, if you will. But we're still going through a very long supply chain just to get that steak on your table, right? But let us continue here with the presentation by Mr. David Friedberg, if I can. Uh, 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 you know, gross uh, global uh, uh, product goes up. And the way that we've scaled up our production to meet all of humans' needs for more food, for more cars, for more entertainment, for more computers, for more bedding, for more housing, is we've taken old tech and scaled it up and centralized it and made repeatable processes out of it. And that was really kind of the framework of the first and second industrial revolution. We centralized manufacturing. We put all these capabilities in one place to repeat a process over and over again and to make a product repeatedly and scale it up and distribute it. Um, and that system is what's largely led to climate change. It's largely led to extraordinary carbon emissions. And, um, you know, we use CO2 to move stuff around. We use CO2 to make stuff. And it's all about getting the cost down through centralization and distribution of, of, of uh, produced product. Um, and so a big thesis for us, and the reason we're called the production board, is how do you rethink the whole systems of production that humans use to make the stuff that we consume? And this can range from stuff like we've talked about on the All In Pod, biomanufacturing. We have several big projects in biomanufacturing where you can use biological organisms to make things. And you can use the biological organisms to make things locally. Um, also 3D printing, right? We've talked a little bit about this. Um, but a big part of what we're going to talk about today is really the beverage industry. So, um, And he's about to get into the beverage industry. But what he mentioned about using biological organisms to make things is basically you have certain bioengineered organisms, viruses, microbes of some kind, tiny little organisms, right? And then you feed them glucose, let's say, and they excrete out a particular product that you want, okay? You want a particular textile, you want leather, something like that. You can make a particular organism create that for you all through bioengineering. Now let's get into the beverage story. I'll tell you a little story. Um, the story is I went to dinner and some scientist I went to dinner with was telling me, hey, there's this really cool research. You should check it out. This guy took a glass of wine and a glass of wine is 87% water, 12% ethanol, which is alcohol, and less than 1% is all the, the compounds that make up flavor, color, odor, and mouthfeel. And there's about 500 of those compounds. And that's what makes the interesting flavor of a red wine. And the guy took all the compounds out and started adding them back one at a time. And he was able to recreate the red wine using just 27 of those compounds. And then he did it again with another red wine and then with a white wine and then other beverages. And basically showed that you could recreate most beverages. Did you catch that? Basically, with less of the stuff that it takes actually to give you the flavor of white wine or red wine, you can recreate that same flavor. 
Well, first of all, it's mostly water, okay? Over 90% water. And then you have the ethanol, which is the alcohol. And then less than 1% is what gives you flavor, color, and mouthfeel. And you don't even need all that stuff that's in the grapes to give you that flavor, the color, and the mouthfeel. Make sense? You don't need all the stuff that's in the grapes to give you the experience that we get and that we want from the wine. Same thing would go for many other things that we consume, right? Whether it be bread or cake or steak. There's lots of things in a steak that you would imagine that don't contribute to what your taste buds are looking for, right? So all that is presumably wasted on us, right? Beverages or all beverages really Mm. with a reduced number of compounds. And so we read all this research at the production board and I started speaking with my team and um, our team started running an R&D cycle. And the R&D cycle was, hey, can we recreate beverages using a simplified set of compounds and doing so, can we reduce the compounds to make all beverages to a fixed number? You know, can we just use 70 or 80 compounds to make wine, beer, coffee, tea, juice, soda? And, you know, the answer is yes. Yes, you can. Now, why is that interesting? Because any beverage, whether it's a bottled water, soda, coffee, tea, juice, wine, whatever, is almost entirely water, right? So beer is 94% water, 5% alcohol, and less than 1% is the chemicals that make odor, color, flavor, and mouthfeel. Same with wine, same with juice. Juice is 93% water, 6 to 7% water, and less than 1% is all the chemistry that makes vitamins, flavor, odor, color, and mouthfeel. And so if that 1% is all that you need to ship to make beverages, why don't we distribute the manufacturing of beverages and put a beverage mm. printer in every home and then ship the 1% that you need to differentiate water into nearly any other beverage? And that's kind of the idea behind this business called Canna. It- the business is called Canna. You get the idea, okay? Rather than produce and ship, and we just talked about the supply chain that's involved, all the agriculture involved, all the shipping and the packaging and the going to the grocery store and all that. How about we just take the 1% that is required to give you flavor, color, mouthfeel, okay? How about we just take that and deliver only that? You can already see the efficiency, the great efficiency. We know how heavy water is. We know how consequential water is to the ecosystem. We know how complex the chain of supply of these goods are only to make this 1% differentiation to water. Okay. Because basically everything you're drinking out there is mainly water and there's 1% that differentiates it. And how come we're spending Well, it's not how come, but right now, given our technology, we have to spend all these billions and billions of dollars moving all this stuff just to get you the wine, which is about 90% water, okay? How about you have the water and the ethanol, and I send you the 1% that is needed. Let us now talk about something that already exists, which is, you know, the, uh, they call it the freestyle machine, the Coca-Cola freestyle machine, where you're mixing up syrups and stuff like that. This is not what we're talking about here, right? We're talking about the actual molecular level reproduction of a glass of wine, as opposed to, you know, some uh, flavor syrups that you're putting together, which is not going to give you the same effect, by the way. And um, and uh, for some for some pro- for some reasons that you can already imagine, making those syrups is more intensive than the idea that he's talking about. Okay. And you cannot reproduce all kinds of things with this, right? We're talking about getting real orange juice, right? By real, I mean reproduced one for one, molecule by molecule, such that when you drink it, you're like, hmm, this is definitely orange juice. It's not something synthetic. How do we get there? So let's talk about the difference between the Coca-Cola freestyle machine and what Mr. Friedberg has created here. Again, taking us one step closer to the Star Trek replicator, ladies and gentlemen lemon and root beer and cherry cola and and they find that fascinating and they have their own little formula they want to do Uh, but here what's the difference between what we see in the freestyle on a technical basis yeah which is i think just a bunch of syrups that get you know mixed together and and what you're doing which is molecular if you could explain it to a lay person so there are basic compounds and we have about 80 of them in our cartridge so we have a flavor cartridge the flavor cartridge slides in the machine sorry i I, i'm not going to speak 
I, I can't share too much detail on the machine because we're going to be doing a, a nice little product reveal in a month or two. Okay, great. Um, and so I'll come back and show you demos and stuff. Uh, you, you can get first look or whatever. But um, just at a high level, there's a flavor cartridge. The flavor cartridge has, a call it roughly 80 different compounds in it. And you can think about those as being like the colors in an inkjet printer, right? C, M, Y, and K. And those compounds are not compounds you're typically hearing of, but they're the compounds that make up all the flavor and everything you drink. What's an example of one of those compounds? Um, you know, they're, they're uh, like, a, like an acid, like an ascorbic acid or a terpene, like a terpene or, or flavor. Um, right. These sort of chemistries that, um, uh, that make up the base of most common flavors that you might. So this is just like the basic colors in your inkjet, inkjet printer. So it's not just like, oh, I have this flavor over here, which is a lemon flavor. And I have this flavor over here, which is a uh, sweet. No, it is the basis by which the flavor profiles of all beverages are made, right? So you have the basic colors from which you can combine and then make all different kinds of colors is the idea here. Uh, these 80 compounds that are in the compound cartridge in this machine that'll soon to be, uh, be released. Uh, kind of allude to when you think about so a certain So to call flavor. it a flavor cartridge isn't exactly accurate because it's not like one of them's almond and one of them's hazelnut Correct. and one of them's cherry. It's, are, these... it's a compound cartridge that's that right. then would make, the 80 would make how many known infinite. flavors? Infinite. And that's what okay. makes it so kick ass. So infinite combination, infinite permutations, if you will, to get you the flavors that you're used to in all these organic drinks that you drink. Okay. The flavor in orange juice, lemon juice, watermelon juice, whatever it is that you're into are a combination of these 80 compounds, organic compounds. Okay, let's continue. And, and then in addition to the flavor cartridge, there's also another cartridge that does uh, a sugar solution, another one that does alcohol. And uh -huh. so those cartridges, all three of them, will last you for a month or two months or three months, depending on how much you're using the machine. And, um, and then using the, the touch screen or the app, you'll be able to print all these different beverages. Um, and so you could have one machine that can print you a, a cola. It can print you a mojito. It can print you a white wine. It can print you wow. a hard seltzer. It can print you an iced tea, an iced coffee. You could flavor your iced coffee. You could add extra caffeine. You could add um, uh, uh, vitamins. You could change the calories. You could have reduced sugar. All the kind of personalization that we're kind of used to in the rest of our world, you can do on this machine. The personalization, for those of you who like the... Uh... Cafe, mocha, upside down, whipped cream, kids, temp, blah, 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 blah. Okay, the personalization, the personalization of your drinks, this allows. So the question in this particular segment was, what is the difference between this and these flavor cartridge uh, combiners that we have out there? Well, this is not that because this is more basic. This is down to the basic elements with which you can create the infinite flavors that us humans have come to expect from all kinds of organic things that we eat. Make sense? So it's not just some hazelnut flavor over here and lemon flavor, no, 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 no. These are the basic 80 compounds from which the infinite plat uh, platter, okay? A plethora of flavors can be built. And also you can, you, the same machine will give you white wine, will give you an espresso, will give you all, all kinds of things and you can increase and decrease the different aspects and different compounds uh, at will. So way more efficient, way more fundamental. And as you can imagine, it'll be way more real. It is real after all, we're going down to the molecular level and molecularly reproducing what we are used to tasting. Now, let's talk about uh, some aspects of this in terms of marketing, because you can already imagine some celebrities, okay, are gonna wanna have their own particular brands associated with this. Okay, there's gonna be the Kim Kardashian brand of a particular kind of uh, juice or whatever. She makes her own particular flavor combination. She keeps the formula secret. And uh, all you simps out there can go and uh, purchase the Kim Kardashian stuff. Well, let's talk about that particular aspect of things. So um, we had Arnold Palmer famously made his drink and it became canned. Or you could have Mr. Beast made Mr. Beast Burger. You could literally have a celebrity like that. Kim Kardashian could say, you know what? I would like to make my own line of skinny beverages that were low calorie and had great flavor and were alcoholic. And then, wow, you all of a sudden, everybody's machine says, would you like a Kim Kardashian pina colada 
skinny pina colada and you press the button and you got it. And that's what I'm most excited about, right? Because we've talked about this on our all in pod a lot is like this creator economy that's that's emerging where there are lots of folks who have influence or or are influencers. Um, and one of the ways that, you know, very, very, very large influencers have been able to monetize their brand historically is by creating a beverage category. But you've got to have 100 million people following you for any beverage business to want to partner with you to make a beverage. And so now, you know, JCal with your million followers on, on Twitter or what have you, you know, you can go promote a beverage brand to, sure. your, to your followers. And uh, as long as they have the ability to print your brand uh, at home, they can use the device to do so. Um, now, this let is me, like... Hold the, on, let me decentralization okay the De decentralization of your brand okay so if you have a youtube following okay you don't have to have 100 million okay in order to create uh your own special brand of uh like a snoop loops uh by master p and snoop dog they have their cereal brand what well, is the mega mega celebrities right master p and snoop dog coming together creating the cereal brand but smaller celebrities those people with smaller brands smaller followings can now create their own specialty beverages right with their own specialty formula right make it just right and it's appealing enough to people such that they can say hey i want in my app for my machine i want to be able to click a button and get the uh you know the ike latte or whatever it may be right let us now talk about the business case or shall we say the business roadmap what is the roadmap for this business going into the future um how do we how does this get uh, monetized okay what is uh what are some of the products that could come behind it what are some of the other add-ons and other things that we can sell to you because as we know okay that's the name of the game right that is indeed the name of the game once you have the first iteration of something you're thinking about all the other things that could be sold behind it let's uh, see what some of those are um, and that's 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 what really enables a lot of what we do is, is really do you, kind of simply this thing let's out. talk about this on a business level do you see this as a premium product that you're going to charge for it sounds like you know based on a subscription here based on a per beverage so you consider a high-end thing or do you consider this a way to save money like people who make those soda streams right the promise of a soda stream is hey, you, you, you have all your soda at home and it's going to cost one tenth or i think they maybe say a quarter of buying coca-cola or yeah. buying S your orange it's it's save money save time save space taste better infinite variety better Got experience it. that's what we have to hit right like it's got to save you money. It's got to have better. Um, Guys, uh, I mean, I would think if it had all these choices and selections, you could go premium and say, hey, listen, you can't get these flavors anywhere else and you can't get this convenience anywhere else. We're going to charge you, you know, 50 cents a soda, a dollar an alcohol beverage. So it's a little bit cheaper, but we're not going bargain basement here. You're right. Gen 1 and, and Gen 1 and the product features and the pricing are going to be a lot different than what we aim for with Gen 3 and beyond. Gen, so you'll Gen do the Roadster, you'll do the Model S before you do the Model X, a uh, Model Y. Right. That's right. Okay. And we're, and we're going to do very limited release on Gen 1 of the device uh, as because we're building Gen 2. And remember, like in hardware, when you build for scale, you get cost down, right? So a lot of the stuff that we're buying is not in volume today. Uh, it's, it's custom fad. So there's a lot of stuff that you get cost savings at volume. And so, you know, are you buying 100,000 or a million parts or 10 million parts? And, and you see a dramatic difference because the line can be run for you for a long period of time and, and the factory can make money making those com components for you. Um, and so that, that's why we kind of think about Gen 3 being our break, breakout device. Mm. Um, and Gen 1 and Gen 2 will have incredible value on their own, um, but they're not going to be for every home, um, for every income level, to replace every beverage. Just like everything else, the first iteration of it, typically expensive. When um, videotape first came out, very expensive. When CDs first came out, very expensive. When computers first came out, very expensive and uh, huge. And he is saying that basically by generation three, such as the roadmap, right? Because they think and storyboard these things out, okay? By generation three is when it's going to be for mass production for everyone's home and all that kind of stuff. Let's continue. Bridge on day one. Uh, that, that's going to come in gen three. Okay. It's a, the non-alcoholic beverages are a trillion dollar market uh, globally. If you succeed at this and every home has one, just like every home has a television, you know, uh, or a refrigerator, what does the world look like in 20 years? So look, I mean, we all drive down the street and we see trucks and trucks and trucks 
delivering bottled beverages to stores, to homes. You can walk through any supermarket and you can see how many aisles are filled with what is mostly water. Um, you know, these, these are uh, plastic, can, and glass bottles that are holding water that's been moved thousands of miles and used a ton of carbon to move that water all of those miles and a ton of carbon to make the containers that store all that stuff. Um, we use 50 to 60 million acres growing all the stuff that we use to make our beverages. All right. What does all that mean? That means that he's going to take out that entire supply chain and the value of that current supply chain is going to go into his pocket. Okay. So the idea is in order to get you your beverages, which are mostly water, you have all this glass, all this plastic, you have miles and miles of road being traveled, gasoline being burnt, polluting the atmosphere, many people in many trucks, truck being manufactured and all that kind of stuff. We have agricultural land being fertilized and irrigated and then harvested. That entire supply chain, just to deliver a glass bottle, which is mainly water to you, when we can take the 1%, the 1%, which makes the differentiation of flavor, color, odor, and mouthfeel. It's only 1% or less, okay, of compounds in that drink that gives you the flavor, odor, color, and mouthfeel, okay? But we're moving all these millions and millions of gallons and pounds of water, energy-intensive, time-intensive, an entire supply chain, okay? So great efficiency being achieved there, but as I alluded to, this is gonna be a huge disruption in the supply chain. What's gonna to happen to the truck drivers filling those grocery stores? Well, like everything else, we know what's gonna happen. They're gonna find other things to do, okay? Other problems to solve, other means by which we need to uh, get our needs met. Because remember, human needs are insatiable. We're gonna want something else. And it's gonna be somebody else that needs to create our means of satisfying that other need or want that we have. So. What are your thoughts about this? What do you think about this new Star Trek replicator? Are you excited about it? I'm sure I am excited about it. I'm looking forward to it and the next iterations of it until we get to the place where we can get a full steak at the click of a button, right? You can be like, I want a Chef Gordon Ramsay special sous vide and ready. And I press this button and it gets created by a biological culture that I just have to feed uh, some yeast and some other things. And basically they create this thing as a byproduct of their mere existence, ladies and gentlemen. So go ahead and leave your comment below. Until next time, stay tuned here for daily updates of news, geopolitical, economic technology. My name is Ike Ogamian. Peace. We are out.